And so we've invited Lockwood Williams and Bathory to speak to this theme of folklore. I'm going to bring you up here, Lockwood, and say hi. <laughs> <laughs> so there is some folklore around when Lockwood and I first met. <laughs> there is a there mm -hmm. is a story that has been woven. Um, I lived down the street from Lockwood growing up. So now we are zooming in from different part of the parts of the world and we have these little windows beside each other on Zoom. But our windows were just a few blocks away from each other as children. And some of the stories that we both grew up in, I would say we were immersed in a big group of children and our families interwoven in like a soup of laughter and stories and all kinds of folklore. Um, but there is a story about when I first met you, Lakaluk, that either you yes. can tell or I can tell. Who wants to tell it? Yeah. I love the way you tell it. Will you tell it <laughs> about how we <laughs> first met? Well, you first met me uh, when my parents brought me home from the hospital. Um, and the, the, that very day, you and your sister came running down the street and burst into the door with little cards that my mom has kept all these 42 years now that you had drawn yourself came running into the kitchen and your sister Liv saw a big bowl of bread rising with a, a tea towel over top of it and she said oh is that the baby <laughs> <laughs> and building on that it's been amazing to see that loaf of bread rise over the years <laughs> And become the star that you are. You're um, you're here to share with us about your incredible creative career and how how things have inspired you over the years around um, developing the the artist that you are. So thank you so much for being here. I'm going to say a couple of things about you uh, that just tell the world how incredible you are, and then we are going to go into your talk and having and, and chatting. So most recently, uh, Lock Luke Williams and Bathory has received the Sobeys Canadian Art Award, which is the highest prize for performing artists in Canada. Um, you have multiple modalities in which you work and develop and create art and have been acknowledged and recognized beyond the Sobe Award in many, many different ways for just your um, influential, in, influential work in, in the world. Um, we have, I'm, I just see a note here. Can people hear me okay? Shiraz is say, asking me to speak more into the mic. How's that, Shiraz? Just want to make sure I'm hosting well here. Okay, excellent. Um, so over, over, over to you to kick us off with the concept of folklore, Lock Look, and I, I think we're going to start with a poem, because one of your many artistic talents is poetry, and also mm -hmm. parenting. Hi, who do we have here? <laughs> yeah. This is my youngest daughter, Naya. She often uh, joins me in, in Zoom. Uh, we've spent so much time together, of course, uh, during the past two years that uh, she takes part in almost everything that I do. Uh, I work from home and she's been home. So here she is. Uh, she can't hear me. Uh, she can't hear anybody because I'm on headphones here. And my so son we'll Ima is uh, over on the other side. <laughs> yeah. we'll and my wait. husband is cooking lunch over there. You might be able to hear the sound of, of the food heating up. It all happens to be during our lunch hour here in Akaluid. So everything's happening all at once, but we're all used to this. Nice. <laughs> Welcome. So I'll uh, over to you to, to share with us about folklore with um, starting with a poem. And then we're actually going to approach this where I'm going to uh, do some questions and responses. And we're going to approach this less as a standalone talk and more as a, a call and response with questions and answers. Mm -hmm. So this piece is called The Invisibility of Thirst. Dryness in my mouth. No one else feels it except me with the desire to drink. The tiniest physiological changes, the signals that bubble from within for life are meant for each one of us to feel. 
my hands. They swell and shrink with the wax and wane of my menstrual cycle. They do the things that I ask them to. They pinch and push and pull and turn, scratch, grasp and slide. They do all these things in articulated ways my Parkinsonian father no longer could when he died. His hands would lift and writhe and flutter in their own will, like a newborn discovering the world, world but conversely, losing touch with his own world. My hands also do things that I don't bid them, bid them to do. I catch them creating the shapes of words as I'm speaking, adding curves to meaty themes and stretched out fingers for exclamation marks. My hands hunger for sounds of their own. My hands sense a social function. Sometimes before my mind catches up, I grab the hand of a child before he falls and he continues walking without knowing the pain of hitting the ground. I rush to hold a woman in labor, cocooning safety and warmth against her blooming body. I unwittingly shake hands with a pedophile, only sometime afterwards wondering why his smile seemed both blithe and sly. My hands fly out to help carry a coffin to its grave. People around me tripping over pieces of ice and frozen ground. The smell of the dead boy inside slowly drifting upward. My hands reach to touch the soft skin of my quickly growing children and stroke the comforting hairs of my husband's body. My thirst. I always wash my hands. No matter what they have touched, I always know that they are mine. Have I washed my hands of it? The orange hues of calluses, the odd scrape from operating machinery, a bit of dryness across the knuckles, nails in, lead, in need of a trim. Only my hands can quench the invisibility of my thirst. They must. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so can we start with talking about the sky? <laughs> yes. So we grew up <clears throat> in Saskatchewan. Also, a lot of sky, a lot of sky. And we grew up in busy, busy households where we would both as younger children in those busy households find moments where we could fall back in the ground and look at the sky as a way to breathe. Mm -hmm. And now you live in a place where the sky is even more incredible. So mm -hmm. how has the sky shaped or influenced the story of your work, the folklore, mm -hmm. the, the creative inspiration of your work? What's your relationship to the sky? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, when we were children, uh, we'd spend so much time observing life on our street, uh, all these teenagers coming in and out of our houses and, and students from all around the world and, and our own uh, peers coming in and out. Uh, uh, but my family uh, always had uh, a getaway, uh, a piece of land where uh, we were able to be. Uh, and what we had was uh, a cabin that had no electricity, no running water. Um, that we hauled buckets of water for ourselves. And it was such a place of incredible peace. Uh, I always remember with my little brother running out once we arrived and just doing exactly that, falling back and listening to the sky. And then we'd lie there for 20 minutes. We wouldn't even know how long we were there. And just listen to all the movement of the air around us and the sky the color of all the, the different aspects of the sky filling us. Uh, and those moments take me straight through to my uh, adulthood now with my own children. We also have a, a cabin here that we built ourselves um, that has no running water and no electricity. Uh, and in the, in the winter time, uh, you go outside and it's just filled with crackling northern lights. And you can watch it sweep from one side of the sky to the other. And uh, we tell stories of, of the, 
the spirits, you know, the, the souls of, of our loved ones that are playing soccer in the Akshamnid, in the Northern Lights. Uh, and then conversely in the summertime, uh, the sky here is just so bright, no darkness, you know, purple blooms of the Arctic flowers and, and all of these sort of pinkish hues as, as the sun comes in and out of twilight 24 hours a day. Um, I know that Matthew Payne is on this um, Zoom call, and that would be something that he remembers from coming to visit us here, that the summertime brightness of the sky. Is there any um, stories that really shaped your childhood? Like when I think about early childhood and the, the imprint that, that the stories have on who we become as we emerge in our creative selves or in our roles as mothers or in just who we are in the world. What are some of your earliest stories that you would describe as folklore that have informed your work? So my parents were uh, very different people. Uh, my father was a, an Englishman who became a professor uh, at University of Saskatchewan, uh, but he also spent most of his adulthood in uh, what is now Nunavut, and he spoke Inuktitut uh, from Bannaktok and from Rankin Inlet, and so he was filled with, with the stories of his friends and, and uh, people that adopted him into the community, um, and my mother is Greenlandic. She's actually also a professor at University of Saskatchewan. Um, but um, a good 30 years later than, than my father. Uh, and she grew up in um, what is now, what are now uh, ghost towns in Greenland. Um, many of the small communities were centralized into bigger communities as a part of the colonial project. Uh, but she grew up on, on her own homeland uh, and being filled with, with stories and folklore and um, spirituality from, from her grandparents who have always been on the land. So uh, as I grew up uh, at our cabin that had no electricity and, and running water, uh, just the fire at nighttime and my parents uh, speaking comparatively to each other. Uh, this is the way that I speak, my father would say. My mother would say in her own dialect. This is, and this is the way that I speak. And they would spend hours just comparing stories of, of the sea goddess, Nuliayuk uh, or Seshuma Anna, or spend hours telling the story of, of the sun and the moon and, and showing how the exact same story exists in many different regions across uh, Inuit homelands. Um, so I was definitely filled with, with so much story as a child. Is there is there a story that you tell your children, like a first story that you whispered in their ear when they were born? You have three children. Yeah, mm. <laughs> yeah well, one story that I mean I've already mentioned uh, that we keep in mind almost all the time is that of the of the Northern Lights of Aksamni, um, and they're so prominent. I know that most Canadians uh, only see them once in a while or as a, as a big treat in their lives, but it's literally you open the window, open the door, and go outside, and, and they're there. They're omnipresent, uh, especially in the winter time, uh, and they're green. Uh, but they can also have these curtains of pink and yellow and blue and purple. Um, and uh, we call them Aksamnirin or Aksamnit, depending on what dialect you're in. And that means the people that are playing soccer. And so the story is that um, as a person uh, passes away, their soul goes up to play this celestial game of soccer with a walrus head. And the point of the game is to, to kick the walrus head so that it goes straight up into the air and then lands into the snow with the tusks down. Uh, and they're such a powerful, inquisitive uh, group of spirits. And of course, they were human at one point, so they really uh, take a lot of interest in what human beings are doing down on the ground. And if you whistle at them, they get very curious and uh, start to come closer and closer to the ground. But if they actually touch the ground, it'll explode the entire universe. 
So as a child, you have that responsibility of making sure that they don't actually ever touch the ground. And if they come too close, you start uh, clicking your nails together or doing your zipper up and down very quickly to make a sound that'll scare them or bark like a dog and they'll go back up. And uh, we've had so many uh, people in our lives and our families that have passed away during my uh, children's childhood. So we always remind them that there they are, right there watching us and playing soft. I love imagining your dad playing soccer in the sky. (laughs) (laughs) So there are other ways folklore can shape, can, can shape our creative work. Um, not always in positive ways. And and Tiffany and Anuksha touched on this when they spoke about their work. So a question around what are some more destructive or pervasive folklores that from your perspective, have have disrupted or oppressed your artistic sovereignty and your your sense of mm. sovereignty in your work. Yeah, Inuk uh, really nailed it uh, in her introduction to the performance. In that, um, Inuit live in a realm of uh, extreme stereotypes, and and the history of that actually is because uh, is that from the very beginning the relationship between Inuit and white people has been performative um, to an extreme point where uh, the so-called explorers uh, trying to find the Northwest Passage and getting lost and raping and pillaging instead of doing anything useful um, would actually take groups of Inuit and bring them to zoos in Europe so that they would be uh, dressed in traditional garb and doing traditional things for everybody else to, to, uh, to gaze upon. Uh, the intensity of the white gaze for Inuit is, is very high. Uh, and so there's so many expectations that, uh, that white people have of Inuit. And it's almost, it's a, actually quite an easy game to fall into is where there's the, the stereotype racist expectations of how Inuit behave. And then there's also the way that Inuit decide to behave for white people. It's, it's this, um, it's this two step that doesn't have much to do with, with the reality of our personalities uh, and of our individuality. Um, and so Tiffany and Inukshuk and I, and, and so many other Inuit artists, uh, we all belong to this collective in which we assert our individuality um, as something that actually adds to our collectivity. The more that we celebrate about a person's uh, personality, uh, sexuality, um, language skills, uh, employment skills, anything about that person that makes them that person, their name, uh, we exemplify them and and cherish them. Uh, And each one of us has a whole different combination of, of soulhood within us and that and that is what we celebrate in fact can you share a bit more about your name about my name yeah yeah Yeah. well my uh full name is is very long actually it's sarah new lack look yes and williams and bathory um and that's actually short compared to my mother's name which is Carla Magdalena Macreda Bearded Christina Katrina Jessen Williamson. Uh, she has two more names than I do. <laughs> um, but uh, when my parents met, uh, which was sort of an incongruent coincidence in the world, um, they conceived me and then got married um, in Greenland. Well, actually, they got married in Saskatoon once and then once again in, in Greenland. Um, they had two anniversaries every year. Uh, so when they had their wedding in, in Greenland, uh, all of my Greenlandic family would stand up and, and give a speech or uh, recite a poem or, or sing a song. And uh, that's normal. Uh, Greenlandic culture is very um, full of song, full of ritual. Uh, but my father hadn't been exposed to that very much before. And he was very much taken aback by uh, how giving the Greenlandic family were in their words. So he finally stood up and he sang this little song. Um, 
Pongao yalugu, kamata kataluchi, lakulu, lakulu, lakulu. And everybody at the, at the wedding ceremony just sat in silence. And then they all looked at my mother's pregnant belly and they all decided right then and there that no matter what gender this baby was born, it's going to be named Lakulu. And that's how I got my name. I didn't, oh, I love that. <laughs> So when, when I close my eyes and when I look at you, open them and see your eyes, the, the feeling that overtakes my body is laughter. <laughs> the feeling of, of laughter, the feeling of uh, being young and being surrounded by our teenage siblings making us laugh all the time. We were the, the little ones just trying to survive in, in, the, in the soup of teenagers but there was a lot of laughter and I have noticed in in following your work over the years that um, you reference fear humor and sexuality as real forces that that really um, are forces in your creative process so mm -hmm. as my final question and in, in cl closing the official speaker piece before we open questions up to the bigger group can we talk about laughter can I ask you about humor and and how is humor and, and laughter a fuel for your work mm. I, I mean to put into context that the trio of themes that you mentioned um, those are the three three of the four basic um, basic emotional or basic um, primary colors of humanity that are played with in uh, the mass dancing that I do. Uh, it's called Wailna. Um, it's a Greenlandic mass dance that uh, existed in pre-colonial times. And then after a, a time of oppression, it came back to life again in uh, the 1970s as we as Inuit strove for um, sovereignty and self-determination. Uh, and so it's a clown act that uh, really celebrates who you are as an Inuk uh, and challenges you to go into audiences to, to play with all of those themes uh, of teaching you how to deal with fear, uh, teaching the audience how to quell their panic when they come across your ghastliness, uh, uh, to celebrate sexuality as human beings are a plurethra and, and uh, a massive prism of sexuality uh, and then of course uh, humor uh, and it's something that uh, is cultural uh, and it's also um, situational uh, and it's also anti-colonial uh, the, the way that Inuit love to laugh and, and create laughter um, it, it's a it's a healing mechanism uh, something funny happens in the midst of great sorrow and, and you feel your heart lift a little bit and it helps you get to the next stage or the next day. Um, you take one morsel of a joke and then your friend adds another and your friend adds another aspect until you're sitting around the table with this joke that just keeps on going for hours and, and then you get asked to leave the restaurant because you're laughing too hard and loud and nobody else can hear what they're saying. That's happened a few times. Uh, and it's also the creation of equality. You know, if I tell you a joke that makes you laugh, you understand where I'm coming from and vice versa. Um, yeah, I live in deep wells of laughter in our, in our family, that's for sure. Is there a joke you've heard recently that, we can, that you can share? Or something funny oh. you saw? <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, that all comes like in one year, out the other, and when's the next laugh coming? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, one, one thing that made me laugh um, in a, it, is when you were sharing some of your recent work and imagining you with a VR headset on. So, so much, of, so much of your work is so embodied and rich and like about body and breath and blood and sex and all of that. And with the pandemic, um, there are ways that you have had to perform and adapt. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. share with us some of your recent work um, so that folks can follow, continue to follow your work into, the, mm. into this sort of future 2.0 version of it. And then I'll, um, while Lakluk is sharing this uh, 
I'll invite the audience to um, put some questions in the chat, and we'll start to generate some questions from from the 124 people who are here in the room with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what yeah. are you working on these days? Yeah, I mean, so as you can imagine, uh, Wild Nook is uh, very COVID unsafe. Um, I can't, I can't go about celebrating sexuality in front of people's faces and <laughs> breathe on them. <laughs> so I haven't actually performed Wild Nook once since March two years ago, this month two years ago. Uh, and so, yeah, I found all sorts of different ways of continuing to, to be creative and, and using Wayan as, as a source of uh, strength and, and wonder. Um, and so the, the next project that I'm working on right now is a, a VR film, a virtual reality. You put those goggles on and you're completely surrounded by another world. Um, and this one is uh, based on short stories that I've been writing uh, about the, the president of Dr. Baluk. And I'm sure many of you have probably heard of Dr. Baluk in its English name or Danish name, Hans Island. Um, and it's uh, a real life island that is uh, hilariously tiny. It's only 1.2 kilometers squared. And it's exactly in the middle point between uh, Danish territory and Canadian territory. And so silly white people, as they always are, um, the Danes and the Canadians had a so-called gentleman's war where they would take out one flag and plant another and then throw a bottle of schnapps on one side of the flag and then a bottle of rye whiskey on the Ridiculous. Uh, because it's Inuit homeland. And uh, so the, the VR experience is, uh, you as a viewer come landing on the back of a bird and land on this tiny, um, very tiny island. And uh, you're witness to the president of Dr. Baluk, which is a republic uh, of uh, Inuit lovers who believe in Inuit feminism and Inuit socialism and equality between all lovers. And of course, I'm the president of this Republic of Dr. Baluk. Um, this VR experience uh, is going to be um, coming out in the next year 2022, probably later on. And it's, uh, we're working on the prototype, which is a five minute experience inside the world of Dr. Baluk. And eventually we're going to make it into several chapters long uh, of you being able to be in the world, uh, listening to the president and, and being challenged to um, question your own uh, sense of fear and sexuality and, and humor as well. If, if we follow your website, will there be updates there on how we can continue to interact with this work? Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's in the chat there. Uh, as long as you can spell Lakuluk, you can find me. Um, Excellent. L double A double K U L U K. <laughs> Um, and when you actually form that world, can can I move there? I want it to be in the world that you're in charge of. <laughs> well, the only um, the the requirement for citizenship is that you take on a circumpolar lover. Oh yes, okay. I mean, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, are you comfortable with Q and A with questions that come from? from so there's two ways we can do q a one is please put your questions in the chat and then i can ask them um on your behalf the other is if you're comfortable and wanting to be on on camera raise your hand and then that helps me be able to find you to pin you so we'll spend about um six or seven minutes with q a and it was just so lovely to hear your stories and to chat with you mm. that flew by no, I Lovely to spend time with you too, Kari. So Hillary has a question. Hi, Hillary. And the question in the chat that you can see there as well, what mediums of art or expression have you explored in your artist's journey? Mm. Uh, definitely physical theater, um, doing wild in, in, in a theater. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that performance is actually only about 50% about what I do. Uh, the other 50% is the reactions of the people that I interact with. Uh, 
and that has been sustaining me uh, and exciting me since I was 13. Uh, it's on pause for the pandemic, of course. Um, I also write. Um, I also curate art, um, Inuit art. And uh, I also create, um, I create things <laughs> that go into art galleries. Uh, there is uh, just a couple of days left in the exhibition at the National Gallery of Canada uh, for the Sobe Awards uh, from uh, 2021, uh, the fall of 2021. Uh, and the piece that, uh, is, that I contributed is um, the skin of a polar bear that um, I shot at our cabin. And the, the story of that polar bear and its skin is, is quite long. Uh, but the end result is that uh, it's the skin is tattered um, and I have it stretched out in the gallery with uh, a video of me projected onto the, the skin itself of me drum dancing to, to honor the bear's spirit and thanking the bear for coming to our family and giving itself as a gift to us. Um, I call it my Princess Leia moment because it looks like I just appear on the skin. <laughs> I just shared a link. Yes, I found Thank you. A, qu a quick Google search. The art newspaper has has this story and a beautiful image there that folks can. Mm. Um, so now I'm going to pin Shiraz. Hi, Shiraz. So Shiraz is going to ask a question. Shiraz, did you want? Hi, did you want to ask your question on camera? Or did you want me to read it for you off the chat? What's your preference? I can read. Uh... Uh, first, thank you. I think your questions uh, carry were excellent because mm -hmm. the moderator sometimes is also a key partner and uh, and the answers. My question is, what do you see is the difference between you, what you learned from your parents and grandparents and what your daughter is learning from your parents and grandparents? And how is the technology affecting uh, the knowledge sharing and experience? Mm. Am I clear? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you for the question. Well, uh, Kari and I were preparing for this morning. Uh, we actually noticed that we've spent half our lives without internet now. Uh, and being the 40 somethings that we are, we've now spent half our lives with the internet. Uh, and our children grow up with. Uh, they call them digital natives, right? Um, they know exactly, they're born into knowing how to work with technology. Uh, and my father was born in 1931 um, when, you know, telegrams were still a relatively new invention. Uh, I remember as a kid, he'd say, I don't know how to turn the radial oven on. Would somebody heat my lunch for me? <laughs> And, and my mother, who was born in 1954, um, she grew up uh, using her muscles to go up and down mountains uh, nonstop. And, and uh, I'm bringing my children up with these high-powered skidoos and, and high-powered rifles in order to be able to, to move across the land and hunt. Uh, so yeah, the, 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 just in terms of the, the velocity of technology within, within the two to three generations of between my parents, myself and, and my children is in, incredible. Um, but we always make a point of going back to the basic of spending time on the land with, with no power, with no running water. Uh, it's such an important experience for my children to know uh, that they can, that they are so, um, blessed, uh, they have such privilege to be able-bodied uh, and to use their strengths, to use their physicality to create heat and water and, and food for themselves as, as family members. Okay. I'm just, ima I'm, I'm imagining all the, all the things there and, and also thinking with a 14 year old, how those notions have helped me the way you describe it helps me integrate 
with a, with a more urban child also to make sure that I'm really attending to those things. Oh, Stella. Mm. Hi, Stella. Are you comfortable being pinned onto the screen here and asking your question? Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Carrie. Thank you for such a beautiful morning. You've just really inspired us. It's just been absolutely stunning listening to your stories. I have a question. You're just so multi-talented um, and you've explored so many avenues of creative expression. I'm just wondering, are there any other forms of creative expression that you've been pondering on exploring uh, moving forward some, at some point in the future? Mm, as an artist? I only know a little bit about a lot of things as the song goes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the virtual reality, I have no clue uh, how to do that. Uh, in fact, <laughs> most of my experiences in virtual reality are walking into a corner and getting stuck looking down at the floor. So <laughs> this is a very new realm for me, uh, and I'm surrounded by um, really talented, uh, supportive people who are well-versed in the world to, to be able to bring the idea of this president of Dr. Baluk to life. And uh, there's a, a other projects in what I almost always accidentally call al alternative reality, but it's augmented reality, um, where you are able to, for example, just pick up your phone and direct it into a space. And then that space shows animations on your phone. Um, that's also very new to me. Uh, I'm, you know, even with my mask dancing, uh, I make a point of doing a different mask on my face every time. Uh, I, I like to be challenged. Um, I like to do things that are new. Um, and that's because I love to have new people. I love to have collaborators who share their best ideas and we all create something that's new and important. Where would your virtual reality be? Like, how could we access it? Where, where is it going to be made available? Um, we're just at the beginning stages of making the prototype now. But uh, once we finish that, I will let everyone know. <laughs> Thank you. you. Keep keep track on your website, and then we uh, let me know, and then we can share with the Creative Mornings community. Is it, we gather every month, so we can always we can always make it known in one of we do thirty second pitches at the end of uh, at at the end of each event. So we'll we'll make it a mm. thirty second pitch. You're part awesome. Yeah, you're part of this group now. We're gonna just keep Aww. sharing your work. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have what time for one more question. Uh, Bridget, Bridget, you have your hand up. Uh, would you like to come on camera and ask or, or unmute on audio or share it in chat? What are you most comfortable Hi, with? Uh, I, I'm dead at you, but I have a question about, oh. um, I have a question about name, how like you, uh, um, older generations name the offspring. Mm -hmm. in, in general? Or, yeah. or in like Michael's family? Yeah, in families, yeah. Yeah. In my family or whose family? Sorry. In, yeah, in your family. Thanks. Okay. Like how did you pick the names of your children? That's, that's, mm -hmm. we could go in that direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what are well, your I, I, names? I, mm, I named off uh, all my mother's names. Uh, she was named after six children that died of the flu right before she was born. Um, and so she took on um, each of their little souls became her souls. And she spent her childhood going to each one of their households to celebrate their birthdays uh, with their parents uh, because she embodies who they were and who they are. But you might've noticed that they're all Christian names, Carla, Magreda, Magdalena, Beata, Christina, Katrina her generation of uh, Inuit were the last of a couple hundred years of uh, people needing to have Christian names that they were baptized by in the Lutheran church. And my generation of uh, Greenlanders, uh, we, have, we have our own names uh, that were always kept underground, uh, but are now officially on paper. 
So uh, I'm I'm black. Look, I have a cousin Nita, Lucia, Kishlak, uh, Nivika, um, Akalu. We, we we all have Inuit names, and so my children's names and my cousins' children's names are also all Inuit. I have a daughter named Akutak, um, and she's 16. My son is Igimak. He's 13, and then the little one that you just saw is Alnaduk, and she's seven. Great question. So to close, I am um, just going to do a quick screen share to share a photo of your mom and you and your child. Aww. Aww. <laughs> uh, love this photo. Um, mm -hmm. And then also would like to share with you. So every month at Creative Mornings uh, for our in-person gatherings, Lock Look, we have uh, postcards with an inspirational quote about creativity that are made by uh, student artists and then handed out. And when we're online, we haven't been able to do that as much, but what we have done is still had the postcards made. We'll send some to you. Um, so I'll just share with you now the postcard that a student, um, just getting it up here to have it there, Marga. I don't have the slides here. So uh, there's a student named uh, Tara Asadi, who's a second year student at the Idea School of Design at Capilano University. And she's drawn a portrait of you and then included a, a quote where you have said, creativity is the ease of accessing your artistic core to come up with expression. <gasps> so we're gonna be sending something to you. Beautiful, artist to artist. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and that brings us kind of to to the end of to the end of this piece. Thank you so much for being here. We were we're we're all going to continue to follow your work. Um, I miss you. I can't wait to see you in person. This has been really mm -hmm. lovely to uh, have you here. And hopefully, you'll now join some of our future Creative Morning gatherings uh, because we'll continue to have Zoom options. So, welcome to the Creative Mornings community. Oh, thank you so much. What a what a great pleasure to be with you and with everybody here.